Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our Father and our God, what a joy it is to be in your house of worship on your holy Sabbath. We thank you so much that uh, there's been a break in the rain, and we saw the sunshine this morning. We ask, Father, that the sunshine of Jesus will radiate this place. I ask, Father, that you will speak to our minds and to our hearts, that as we study the story, the tragic story in many ways of King Saul, that you will help us to learn the lessons which will be useful in our personal walk with Jesus. We thank you, Father, for hearing and for answering our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title of our study for today is Rebellion is as Witchcraft. Several of you have expressed that this is a very, very uh, intriguing title. Actually, it's not my title. It's taken directly from uh, the book of 1 Kings, which speaks about the story of King Saul. And I would like to begin our study this morning by going to 1 Samuel chapter 9, and I would invite you to go with me there. We're going to be mostly in 1 Samuel uh, for our study this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 9, and I would like to begin at verse 2. We have here a physical description of Saul. It says there, and he, that is Saul's father Kish, and he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. So you can imagine Saul, very good looking, and very imposing because of his stature, head and shoulders above the rank and file. But this did not go to Saul's head, at least at the beginning. Because we're told that when God chose Saul to be king of Israel, he manifested a spirit of humility and unworthiness. We're told in 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verses 21 and 22 the following, And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjaminite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? and my family the least of all families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak like this to me? Why would God choose me to be the king of Israel? I'm of the most insignificant tribe and the most insignific insignificant family. I'm not qualified to be the king of Israel. So in spite of his imposing appearance, and in spite of his good looks, he felt his own unworthiness when he was called to be king of Israel. But in spite of his unworthiness, he accepted the call of God. And we're told in 1 Samuel chapter 10, that when he accepted God's call and he became the king of Israel, he experienced a true conversion experience. In fact, we're told in 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 6, and we'll also read verse 9, the following. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and be turned into another man. By the way, that's called conversion. You will become a new person. And then we're told in verse 9, so it was, when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, that God gave him, that is, God gave Saul another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. In other words, God made Saul another man. He gave Saul another heart. He gave him a new heart. He experienced a conversion experience. In told that Saul was also given the gift of prophecy. Notice 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 10, the very next verse. It says, when they came there to the hill, 
there was a group of prophets to meet him then the Spirit of God came upon him, that is upon Saul, and he prophesied among them. Now when Saul was introduced to the people, the people went wild, mainly because of his physical appearance, head and shoulders above everyone. They didn't realize that what God was looking for was someone who had humility and had a sense of his unworthiness and someone who had experienced conversion and who had received a new heart, someone who could govern Israel with wisdom. But we're told in 1 Samuel chapter 10 verses 23 and 24 what impressed the people. It says, So they ran and brought him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, even Samuel was impressed. Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen that there is no one like him among all the people? So all the people shouted and said, Long live the king! Impressed about his physical external appearance and even Samuel was impressed and was caught up in this reason for exalting Saul. Now it's important to realize that when Saul began to govern he received a list of written instructions on how to rule in a godly way. We're told in 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 25 the following, Then Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. This actually was a copy of the book of Deuteronomy which has the blessings and the curses of the covenant which told the king how to behave himself, how to govern wisely. So in other words Saul had written revelation about how to govern Israel. But Saul not only had written revelation, Saul also had a prophet in his midst. Samuel we might say was his personal prophet. He accompanied uh, Saul wherever he went. In other words, Saul not only had the benefit of written instructions from the Lord, he also had the benefit of a prophet in his midst to enlighten and to describe and to amplify what was contained written in that book. At the beginning of his rulership, Saul manifested a wonderful character, a character of a converted man. In fact when he was crowned as king there was a group of rebels that were very unhappy about being king. We're told in 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verses 26 and 27, And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and valiant men went with him, whose hearts God had touched. But some rebels said, How can this man save us? So they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. It would have been very easy for Saul to say, Oh, you don't want to recognize me? I'll take care of you. Because he was the king. Basically, he could have done whatever he wished. But he shows moderation and he shows calm. He does not act rashly. And so then Saul goes into his first battle, the battle against the Ammonites. And we're told that he gained a signal victory over them. After he gained the victory, everybody of course was pumped up, and so they said to Saul, you know what we ought to do now? We ought to take all of those rebels who didn't think that you would make, that you would actually make a good king, and you could lead us to victory, and we ought to have all of them killed. And even though Saul later on in his life showed a rashness and a rush to action with thinking, we find that Saul said, and these words are found in chapter 11 and verse 13, Not a man shall be put to death this day, for today the Lord has accomplished salvation in Israel. Notice that he gives honor and glory to God, Notice that he does not act rashly, he's actually benevolent towards his enemies who might threaten his throne. 
Now it's very important to realize that in a contact that Saul had with Samuel Samuel told Saul that he should meet him at Gilgal, in other words Samuel said I'm going to come to Gilgal, I'm going to meet you there and wait until I arrive to make the sacrifice, I'm going to make the sacrifice when I arrive. 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 8 has that. Samuel says you shall go down before me to Gilgal and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. In other words the prophet is saying don't make the sacrifices until I arrive. This is the word of the Lord. This is the command of the Lord. And suddenly we begin to detect a serious flaw in the character of Saul. He had a problem strictly obeying the commands and the word of God. Now it happened like this, the Philistines had come against Israel, they had 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen plus all of the people in their army were told in chapter 13 verses 5 through 7 that the enemies were like the sand of the sea and of course Israel was filled, filled with fear and so many of the soldiers that Saul had started to desert there were actually 3,000 of, the, 3, of them originally and there were only 600 left and Saul said all of my armies are going to leave and the Philistines are going to be able to defeat us and so I need to be assured of God's blessing and so contrary to the explicit command of God we find that Saul decided that he could wait for Samuel no longer and we're told that he decided to offer the sacrifices upon the altar. Here we find Saul a man who acted not on the basis of principle but on the basis of impulse thinking that the end could justify the means. A man who had a lack of faith in God's word because God had said through Samuel I'm coming, we will offer the sacrifices, God will be with Israel but he disobeyed the explicit command of God, he acted by impulse not by faith in God's word. And right after he offered the sacrifices Samuel appeared and Samuel said to him what is this that you have done, in fact let's read it in 1 Samuel chapter 13 beginning with verse 11 it says, and Samuel said what have you done? And Saul said, notice he's saying the circumstances demanded that I disobey the word of God. The situation demanded that I change God's plan and that I go to plan B. And Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said, the Philistines will not now come down on me at Gilgal and I have not made supplication to the Lord, therefore I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering, in other words the circumstances demanded that I disobey the explicit command of God. And now notice, and Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly, you have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, in other words you have disobeyed God's word which he commanded you, for now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. You see Saul was not the type of person who said God commands us to do things this way and I'm going to do it this way no matter what the circumstances, I am simply going to do what God says and let the chips fall where they may. He felt that it was necessary sometimes to violate God's word because the situation demanded it. We might say that he was a situation ethicist, in other words ty a type of Robin Hood uh, ethics where you steal from the rich and give to the poor, I know God says that you're not supposed to steal but as long as you give to the poor it's okay, 
And that's the way that Saul looked at things. That was the first step downward on the slippery slope to perdition for Saul. We notice this defect in his character that he does not live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He takes circumstances and allows the circumstances to dictate what he should do and what he should not do. Then we go to chapter 14. We sit, find another step down the slippery slope. You see Jonathan went against the Philistines and he gained a signal victory over the Philistines. In fact Jonathan uh, only slew 20 plus Philistines and God took care of the rest because we're told there in chapter 14 that the swords of the Philistines were turned upon one another they, they had confusion in the camp and they started slaying one another and Saul of course uh, had given an oath where he said listen uh, until I am avenged on the Philistines no one will eat or drink anything, everyone will fast until the evening, that is until sundown. That was a decree that God had not given to Saul. You see he is actually giving his own oaths and his own decrees about what his soldiers should do and what his sh soldiers should not do. And so it happens that uh, the, the soldiers uh, that Saul had and whom had been commanded by Jonathan went into a wooded area and they were famished because they'd been in battle and suddenly in the woods they find this area where there's honey oozing from a tree or oozing from some way, uh, somewhere, a honeycomb and of course they know the oath that Saul has given and that is that no one is to taste anything or drink anything until the sun sets, until the evening and so even though all of the soldiers were worn out they obeyed the command of King Saul, the unreasonable command of King Saul. But you see Jonathan had not heard about this command or about this oath. And so Jonathan saw one uh, honeycomb and he stuck his staff in the honeycomb and he took his finger and he uh, licked the honey and uh, we're told in scripture that uh, the eyes of Jonathan were brightened as a result of the honey. In other words his strength was refurbished. And then they told him, by the way, do you know that Saul, your father, has said that nobody is to taste anything until sundown on pain of death? And Jonathan said, I didn't know that he had uh, given that oath or he had said that. Uh, he says, besides that, that's an unreasonable decree because all of these soldiers are fighting hard. Why should they fast? Why should they not be able to drink? In other words, it was an unreasonable decree that Saul had given. Well, Saul then says let's go finish off the Philistines and there's a priest in the midst of course and so the priest says I think we should consult the Lord before we go and finish off the Philistines most of the work has been done but we should go perhaps and finish off the rest and so the priest says let's inquire of the Lord to see if this is his will and we're told in the story there in chapter 14 that Saul uh, was not answered by God in other words God gave him no answer what God was saying is I'm very distressed and disturbed by the fact that you gave this oath and this decree that your troops could not eat or drink anything that is not my command that's your word that's your command you should have allowed them to and to drink and so Saul takes the silence of God as a sign that God is disturbed because somebody has sinned against his oath and so to make a long story short it's discovered that Jonathan has eaten a little bit of honey there in the woods and so Saul tells Jonathan this very day you're gonna die because you violated my oath. We start detecting in Saul a very interesting defect. He goes not by the word of God but when he gives a word he expects everybody to do what he says on pain of death and if it hadn't been for the fact that the soldiers and the people stood up for Jonathan we find this in 1st Samuel chapter 14 and verse 45 it says but the people said to Saul shall Jonathan die who has accomplished this great deliverance in Israel? certainly not 
as the Lord lives not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground for he has worked with God this day so the people rescued Jonathan and he did not die we begin to detect that Saul is becoming a bit unreasonable he with impunity violates the word of God he imposes his own word or his own oaths on pain of death but these were only the first steps in the road to perdition we find in 1st Samuel chapter 15 that Saul goes against the Amalekites and God gives some specific instructions as to what to do with the Amalekites in chapter uh, 15 in verses 1 through 3 of 1st Samuel we find these words Samuel also said to Saul the Lord said sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hear the voice of the words of the Lord. Notice it's very clear. Heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts. Is this the will of God that's being expressed clearly? Absolutely. I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them what does the word all mean? it means just that all but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. He even gives a list of animals which are supposed to be slain. But we're told that Saul once again disobeyed the explicit word of God, the explicit command of God. 1 Samuel 15 verse 9 says, But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them, but everything despised and worthless, that, that they utterly destroyed. And when this happens, God is agonizing. It's interesting to notice how in the next few verses, you know, the attitude of God is revealed with such clarity and the attitude of Samuel as well. Notice verses 10 and 11. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king. For he has turned back. Notice he's turned back. He was following and now he's made a U-turn he was converted and now he's backtracking it says he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments and it grieved Samuel and he cried out to the Lord all night and so then Samuel after agonizing and the Lord agonizing over this situation where Saul has blatantly violated the command of God and he's done things his, his own way obviously we're going to notice with a good motivation the next day Samuel goes to meet Saul and I want you to notice it's a rather lengthy passage but it's very powerful 1st Samuel 15 and beginning with verse 13 then Samuel went to Saul and Saul said to him blessed are you of the Lord I have performed the commandment of the Lord Oh, now, now not only is he violating God's commandment, but he is openly what? Lying. But Samuel said, What then is this bleating of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the ox which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites. Notice, they have brought them from the Amalekites. Another flaw. He didn't, he didn't take responsibility for his own actions. So they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen. And now notice, there was a good motivation, Samuel, to sacrifice to the Lord your God. So I had a sincere motivation in disobeying what God said. 
By the way this is called rationalization. It's called justifying sin under the pretext that we're doing what God says we're supposed to do. And so it says, and Saul said they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet. And I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak on. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes. What is he saying there? He's saying you were once what? You were once humble. You were once willing to follow my will, what I said. Not substitute your word in place of mine. You weren't a rationalizer, you weren't a liar as you are now. He says, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of all the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? You know it's evil even to do what we consider to be good under good pretext when God has said don't do it. And Saul said to Samuel, notice this, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. This is really self justification isn't it? He said, you're wrong, I have obeyed the word of the Lord. Or the voice of the Lord. And gone on the mission on which the Lord sent and brought back Agag king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. And now notice, but the people took of the plunder, passing the buck, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, and we did it for a good reason Lord, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Are you starting to detect a series of flaws in the character of Saul? Slowly but surely he's backtracking on his conversion experience. You know there are people who say that once you're saved you can never be lost. This is one of the most powerful stories in scripture that you can be lost after you're saved. You can be born again and you can be lost. If you do not persevere unto the end as scripture says. And now I want you to notice what Samuel's response was. It's found in verse 22. And this is where our title comes from. Then Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Is God so concerned about rituals and ceremonies and religious practices as with obeying His voice? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. That means to obey is better than ritual or ceremonies. And to heed than the fat of rams. And now notice, for rebellion, at this point was Saul rebellious against God's clearly revealed will? Absolutely. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. You say how can rebellion be witchcraft? We'll come to that in a few moments. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, see constantly the idea is he's rejected the word of the Lord and following his own word and his own will. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. And then of course Saul repents. Notice what we find in verses 24 to 31. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. See what he's doing? Is this true repentance? True repentance means the buck stops here. I'm to blame, nobody else is to blame. 
But he's saying, you know, I did transgress the word of the Lord, the commandment of the Lord, but, you know, it was because of the people. Verse 25, now therefore please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. In other words, what he's sorry about is that he's going to lose his kingship. He's not sorry because he violated the commandment because he's truly repentant. Because he's truly sorry for what he's done. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you for you have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned around to go away, you can, you can just feel the desperation. Saul seized the edge of his robe and it tore. So Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he is not a man that he should relent. Then he said, I have sinned. Yet honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. This was false repentance. It was like the repentance of Judas, who went and threw the money when he saw that his plan had backfired. In other words, it was repentance over the consequences of sin and not over sin itself. And God was already at this point choosing the successor of Saul. In fact in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7 God says something very interesting to Samuel. Because Samuel had been impressed with the physical stature of Saul. And so notice chapter 16 and verse 7, but the Lord said to Samuel do not, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have refused him. In other words, don't do like you did with Saul. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And then comes the most tragic part of the story of Saul. This rationalizer, this liar, this individual who blames others, this individual who has the tendency of constantly going against the express will of God, this individual who substitutes his word and commands on pain of death instead of what God has commanded. We're told that as a result an evil spirit started tormenting Saul. Do you remember that rebellion is as what? Witchcraft. When you fail to listen to the word of God, you will end up listening to the word of another spirit. That's right. When you cease to be under the control of God and you rebel against God, another spirit will come to control you. Someone in the world of the occult whose name is Satan. It's risky business going against the clear revealed Word of God. We're told in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 14, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Notice that he did have the Spirit, departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. When it says from the Lord, it means that the Lord allowed it. And Saul's servant said to him, surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. But even at this point, probation had not closed for Saul. Because we're told in verse 23 that there were periods when David came and played his harp before Saul that the spirit would depart. He was not totally and completely possessed at this point yet. There was still hope. Notice verse 23. And so it was, whenever the spirit from God was upon Saul, that David would take a harp and play it with his hand. Then Saul would become refreshed and well, and the distressing spirit would depart from him. You see, his destiny hung in the balance. He could yet return to the condition he was in at the moment of his conversion. The spirit was tormenting him, but the spirit had not possessed him. But then David fights Goliath and gains the signal victory over Goliath. And the women of Israel begin singing the glories of David. And now we catch another flaw of Saul, which he does not allow the Holy Spirit to overcome in his life. You see, he's hanging on to these tendencies and sins. He's not allowing the Holy Spirit to, to get rid of them. 
In fact, we're told there, so the women sang as they danced. Did I give you the reference? The reference is 1 Samuel 18, 7 through 9. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Then Saul was very angry. Oh, now he starts having a spirit of jealousy and anger. And he's looking over his shoulder. Then Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. He had no peace from that day forward. Because he was always looking over his shoulder, thinking that David was going to take his place. And then instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to subdue this tendency in his life, he allows jealousy to become rage. And he begins his onslaught on David. In fact, we're told in 1 Samuel chapter 18 verses 10 and 11 that Saul tried to kill David. Anger is now manifesting itself in an evil action because that's why the Bible says that he who is angry with his mother has already committed murder in his heart. It says there, and it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul and he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand as at other times. But now notice the music is not going to uh, cast out this evil spirit who's, who is tormenting. It says, so David played music with his hand as at other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand and Saul cast the spear for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. And then of course Saul uses other means to try and get rid of David. He sends him on a dangerous mission among the Philistines with the hope that he'll get killed. That's 1 Samuel 18 verse 17. Then he gives David his, his daughter in marriage so that he has closer access to David. And then of course we have the story in 1 Samuel chapter 19 verses 5 and 6 where Saul tries to pin David to the wall a second time. We're told uh, in verses 9 and 10 regarding this event when he uh, wanted to hurl his spear, or actually hurled his spear at David it says, now the distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul and he sat in his house, house with his spear in his hand and David was playing music with his hand then Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear but he slipped away from David's, from Saul's presence and he drove the spear into the wall so David fled and escaped that night. And then of course you see the terrible, the horrendous uh, character of Saul and how much, how far south so to speak Saul has gone with the experience that happened in the city of Nob. I mean Saul had the high priest killed, he had 85 of the priests killed, he had every man, woman and child slain and he raised the city to the ground simply because he suspected that the high priest was sympathizing with David, his enemy. And so in the next chapters of 1 Samuel you find David being persecuted by Saul relentlessly like a wild beast. And then you come to the tragic end of Saul's life. Isn't this a sad story? I mean it's so sad. You know I, I, I shed a tear or two last night when I was sitting and finalizing uh, what I was going to share with the congregation this morning. Someone who had such a brilliant start but because of serious flaws in his character which he did not allow the Holy Spirit to overcome and to conquer in his life he went down the slippery slope to destruction and perdition. So now comes the final chapter of Saul's life. Do you remember rebellion is as what? is as witchcraft. Now Saul is going to live the words of Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 28 we find Saul going to contact a witch. Rebellion is as witchcraft. He's rebelled against God, he's trampled on the commandments of God. He's justified himself. He's filled with jealousy. He's filled with anger. He's allowed all of the evil traits of his, uh, of his character to manifest themselves when he should have allowed the subduing influence of the Spirit to overcome them. And now comes the climax of his life. 
God does not answer by Urim or Thummim or by prophets or by in any way, any of the traditional ways. So he goes to consult the witch of Endor. And it's interesting, I'm not going to read the verses, but do you know the word witchcraft that we read in 1 Samuel 15, 23 is the identical Hebrew word kesem which is used in chapter 28 and verse 8 where Saul says to the witch please divine for me what is going to happen tomorrow the word divine there is practice witchcraft and try and communicate with the dead to tell me what's going to happen because the Lord is not telling me anymore rebellion leads to what? to witchcraft rebellion is at, as witchcraft and stubbornness is as idolatry an amazing statement it says Samuel 28 8 and 9 so Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes and he went and two men with him and they came to the woman by night and he said please conduct a seance this is a, uh, the New King James translation please conduct a seance actually it's the same word divine to, uh, divine not as in God being divine but to uh, do wor a work of divination divine for me and bring up for me the one I shall name for you and so of course the purported spirit of Samuel comes up although it's not really Samuel it's an evil spirit it's Satan disguised as Samuel who now is going to speak to Saul Ellen White has a very perceptive comment on this she says in Conflict and Courage page 172 Saul knew that in this last act of consulting the witch of Endor he cut the last shred which held him to God see he st up to this point he still could have uh, been influenced by the Holy Spirit he knew that if he had not before willfully separated himself from God this act sealed that separation and made it final he had made an agreement with death and a covenant with hell the cup of his iniquity was full and then do I need to tell you about the final end of Saul he committed suicide by falling on his own sword his body then was found by the Philistines in the field they stripped the body of its armor they cut off the head they took the head to uh, the temple of Dagon and exhibited it, hung it in the temple of Dagon and then they dragged his body to Bethshan and hung it up by chains for the birds of the air to eat and if it hadn't been for some friends of his from Jabeth Gilead that rescued his body and gave it an honorable burial he would have been eaten by the birds of the air tragic story a story that speaks to us because we might have had a good beginning but the Bible says he who perseveres unto the end will be saved. Ellen White says that one sin cherished will annul all the power of the gospel in our lives. And by the way, I would be remiss not to introduce what we're going to speak about in the next sermon in this series. There's a striking parallel between Judas and Saul. Both had a good beginning. Both were chosen by God both overshadowed all of the other disciples in stature and ability to share this with you but both were filled with arrogance and pride and thirsted for power both desired to be praised and eulogized both were constantly warring against the will of God in both the devil entered, entered their hearts in both you have an attempt to kill in one case David in the other the son of David in both cases after the fact they both repent 
but it's a false repentance and both commit suicide and in the case of Judas the Bible says that the dogs ate his body just like the birds were to eat the body of Saul because both of these individuals went down the same road in our next sermon we're going to study about the character of Judas in the Gospels it's interesting to notice that in Psalm 109 which is speaking about the experience of uh, Saul and it's quoted by Jesus about Judas as well it speaks about somebody taking his office somebody taking Saul's office, it's applied by Jesus to speak about somebody taking Judas's office when Matthias was elected, let me read that for you, Psalm 109 verses 6 through 9 it says, set a wicked man over him and let an accuser stand at his right hand when he is judged, this is the betrayer when he is judged, let him be found guilty and let his prayer become sin that's true of Saul let his days be few in other words, he's not going to reach the full number of his years and let another what? take his office let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow that is a divine prophecy about Judas but according to scholars the historical context is the context of the experience of Saul because Saul prefigures the experience of Judas now folks the Bible tells us that it is, it is risky business to go beyond the word of the Lord, to change the word of the Lord, to substitute the word of the Lord, to not follow the word of the Lord as it is written, as God speaks it to us. Do you realize if you go with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that this same thing is going to happen at the end of time? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and verse 9, it's speaking about the final Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9 notice what it says the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteousness or unrighteous deception among those who perish notice why do they perish? because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved and because they did not receive the truth like Saul because they did not obey the commands of God like Saul it says and for this reason God will send them what? strong delusion, doesn't mean that God deludes them it means that they step back from God and as a result God allows Satan to come in and control just like Saul it says and for this reason God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness so at the end of time we're told that those who do not receive the love of the truth eventually God will step back and a strong delusion will overtake them just like with the case of Saul that's the reason why in Revelation chapter 18 if you go with me there, Revelation chapter 18 speaking about Babylon by the way Babylon is apostate Christianity, you're aware of that right? Babylon is apostate Christianity those who, who trample upon the Sabbath of the Lord even though God says the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God at the end of time there are going to be many who are going to say we're going to substitute our word instead of the word of God and they trample on the direct command of God notice what happens as a result Revelation chapter 18 and verse 2 and he cried mightily with a loud voice saying Babylon the great is fallen is fallen and has become a dwelling place for what? demons a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird that's quite a description of Babylon because she has rejected the truth of God she is filled with what? with demons according to this in other words he who does not allow his life to be under the control of God will inevitably be under the control of another spirit allow me to read you a couple of statements in closing 
Great Controversy page 36 every ray of light rejected every warning despised or unheeded every passion indulged every transgression of the law of God is a seed sown which yields its unfailing harvest the Spirit of God persistently resisted is at last withdrawn from the sinner and then there is left no power to control the evil passions of the soul and no protection from the malice and enmity of Satan. It's a powerful statement. That's why the Bible says if you hear His voice do not harden your heart today if you hear His voice. In another statement Ellen White speaks about the unpardonable sin you know some people wonder what is the unpardonable sin? the unpardonable sin was when, uh, when Saul reached the point of consulting the witch of Endor at that point it was unpardonable, up to that point he went down, 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 hardened, 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 hardened but when he went and consulted the witch, rebellion and witchcraft blended together the unpardonable sin is simply the culmination of a series of disobediences to the will of God Ellen White says the same law obtains in the spiritual as in the natural world. He who abides in darkness will at last lose the power of vision. That's, that's true. That's physically true. He who abides in darkness will at last lose the power of vision. He is shut in by a deeper than midnight blackness and to him the brightest noontide can bring no light. He walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. Through persistently cherishing evil, willfully disregarding the pleadings of divine love, the sinner loses the love for good, the desire for God, the very capacity to receive the light of heaven the invitation of mercy is still full of love the light is shining as brightly as when it first dawned upon his soul but the voice falls on deaf ears the light on blinded eyes no soul is ever finally deserted of God given up to his own ways so long as there is any hope of his salvation man turns from God not God from him our Heavenly Father follow, follows us with appeals and warnings and assurances of compassion until further opportunities and privileges would be wholly in vain. The responsibility rests with the sinner. By resisting the Spirit of God today, He prepares the way for a second resistance of light when it comes with mightier power. Thus He passes on from one stage of resistance resistance to another until at last the light will fail to impress and he will cease to respond in any measure to the Spirit of God then even the light that is in thee has become darkness the very truth we do know has become so perverted as to increase the blindness of the soul sobering words it's kind of like an alarm clock what happens if you sleep through an alarm clock enough times? the time comes when the alarm clock sounds and you can't hear it you see the voice of God is like an alarm clock it says wake up, give me your sins allow your spirit to come in and subdue the passions of your life the defects of your character, allow me to come in and rectify it unfortunately many times people say well you know uh, I can do this this one time and uh, I'll overcome it later reminds me of the story of Gulliver, you remember Gulliver's travels? when he went into the land of the, of the little, little small people in stature and they started uh, tying him up with threads, you remember that? and you know Gulliver says ah oh, thread I can break thread 
But what happens you ha if you have enough threads around you? The thread becomes rope. Because a rope is composed of a bunch of threads. And so what happens is we're tied according to the Bible with the cords of our own sins. And there is no escape. And that's what the Lord wants to prevent from happening in our lives. Are we listening to the voice of God? Are we obeying every known duty? The voice of mercy and compassion is open before us today. All we have to do is hear His voice and walk out in faith in the path that He has established for us. Folks, I pray to God that none of us will go down the road of Saul. <laughs> Tragic story. A life that began with true conversion, a new heart, the Spirit in the life. But because he did not allow the Spirit to come in to subdue the cherished sins in his life, they overtook his life and eventually destroyed him. May we listen to God's voice. And may God, through His Spirit, refine and noble and overcome the deeds of our characters.